Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to St. Peter's. Um, I'm Shira West. I'm head of the Humanities Division here, and it's my great pleasure to, to welcome you all to the lecture tonight. Um, this is the um, inaugural year of the Humanitas Visiting Professorship of Rhetoric and Public Persuasion at St. Peter's College. Um, in a minute, I'll say a few words about our speaker, but first, just to say a little bit about the series, and for those of you who were here last night, you may have heard some of this before, but there will be new people in the audience tonight. Um, the Humanitas professorships at Oxford and Cambridge enable leading practitioners and scholars to come over the course of a week and address major themes in the arts, social sciences, and humanities. The Humanitas professorships were created by Lord Weidenfeld <coughs> and are funded and facilitated by the Institute for Strategic Dialogue with the support of benefactors. This professorship has been supported by the generosity of Freud Communications, and the university and college owe a great thanks to Matthew Freud. But these lectures have another essence. They're in memory of the late Philip Gould, who died last year, age 61, leaving a considerable political inheritance as well as a spiritual one, encompassed in his final book, When I Die, Lessons from the Death Zone. Philip Gould was Tony Blair's principal strategist, as well as pollster. Anyone who met him knew that he thought long and hard about the relationship between the media, policy formation, and politics, not merely as a tactician trying to gain legitimate political advantage, but because he knew that these relationships are often decisive and defining the nature of democracy itself. And so tonight's visiting professor, Mark Thompson, was a humanities student at Merton, where he read English. Um, he survived that in some style before joining the BBC, where he rose fast and high. He's at root a journalist. He edited the main evening television news and panorama before running large parts of BBC television's general factual output. He was subsequently, among other things, controller of BBC Two and head of television. He became chief executive of Channel Four in 2002 and director general in 2004 um, of the BBC. He's about to start work now. In fact, Monday, he starts in his new job as chief executive of the New York Times. I'm absolutely delighted that he's agreed to be the first visiting professor in rhetoric and public persuasion, and I hope you will let me add, it's also a very great personal pleasure for me. His overall title tonight is Policy Rhetoric and Public Bewilderment, The Cloud of Unknowing, and, um, and so I turn it over to you now, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Shira. Um, uh, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. The climate change debate is much more than just a battle over scientific theories and environmental statistics. At its core is the question of which approach our society should take in view of a serious concern that could possibly turn out to be a real problem sometime in the future. What rational societies and policymakers need to ask is what are the most reasonable and the most cost-effective policies that neither ignore a potential problem that may possibly materialize in the distant future, nor the actual economic costs of such policies here and now? Fundamentally, these are social, ethical, and economic questions that cannot be answered by science alone, but require careful consideration by economists and social commentators. Now, those aren't my words. They're the words of Dr. Benny Pisa introducing the Global Warming Policy Foundation's annual lecture in October 2011. Dr. Pisa is a social anthropologist who's also the director of the foundation, whose chairman is the former Conservative Chancellor, Nigel Lawson. And I want to begin this evening by taking a close look at this passage. There it is. Now, at first, what comes across 
I think, is the judicious tone. Climate change is a serious concern, which might turn into a real problem. What, quote, rational societies and policymakers have to do is to arrive at public responses which are both reasonable and also cost-effective. Serious, rational, reasonable. Now, if we look closer still, we can spot a little rhetorical filigree. Within a couple of sentences, that serious concern begins to get pushed linguistically away from us with a triad of qualifications. It turns out that it's a potential problem that may only possibly happen in a distant future, whereas staring us in the face is another triad which is only too immediately present, the actual and specifically economic costs which we'll have to pay here and now. These contrasting triads are a trope which were used, studied, and defined thousands of years ago. Having thus contextualized and fixed climate change, Benny Pizer then turns to science's role in formulating a response. Here comes another triad. Fundamentally, these are social, ethical, and economic questions which, quotes, cannot be answered by science alone, but require careful consideration by economists and social commentators. Now, that word fundamentally is important. What it implies is that the layer of policy consideration, which addresses social, ethical, and economic questions, is somehow weightier or more critical than the scientific layer. It's as if the science was a necessary but insufficient precursor to the real debate. In support of this, let me quote Dr. Peisler a few months earlier. The global warming hysteria is well and truly over. How do we know? Because all of the relevant indicators, polls, news coverage, government U-turns, and a manifest lack of interest amongst policymakers, shows a steep decline in public concern about climate change. Now, there is considerable polling evidence to support Dr. Pizer's contention that by 2011, public anxiety about climate change was indeed receding. But what this second quote again implies is that there are two layers of discourse about climate change. A scientific layer, whose relevant indicators are atmospheric temperatures and so on, and a separate layer of public perception, policy, and politics with its own quasi-scientific metrics, opinion polls, news coverage, and that presumably slightly harder to measure, quote, manifest lack of interest amongst policymakers. The good news, as far as Dr. Peiser is concerned, is in, the, in this second layer, the metrics are going his way. But of course, none of that tells us anything at all about the first layer. The planet could be heating up, even as public interest in climate change cools. The subordination implied by that fundamentally in Dr. Pizer's first quote is not just of the science of climate change, but of science as a whole. When it comes to policy discussions and the assessment of possible responses and mitigations, whatever science comes up with will require careful consideration by economists and social commentators. Now, I know what economists are, but who are these social commentators? What training and qualifications do you need to become one? Or is social commentator, like community leader, an office which involves an element of self-election? Now, if you read through the names on the Board of Trustees of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, and indeed some of the authors of its reports, you're left with the impression that in practice, social commentators means retired politicians and civil servants, academics in the social sciences, and, and I'm sorry to have to break this to you, journalists. So let's try dropping that into Professor Pizer's last sentence. These are questions that cannot be answered by science alone, but require careful consideration by journalists. It doesn't really work, does it? Why? Well, that's because of the stark difference in the authority of scientists and journalists. A 2005 Mori survey asked 2,000 respondents to what extent they would trust people from different professions to tell the truth. For scientists, the resulting net trust score was plus 52%, for professors plus 67%. For politicians generally, the score was minus 53%. <laughs> and for journalists as a class, minus 61%. In a straight fight for credibility between scientists and journalists, journalists are going to be massacred, and retired politicians won't fare much better. 
Much safer then to make them kneel, be anointed, and arise as members of the splendidly new and untainted category of social commentator. Yesterday evening, I talked about language. This evening, I want to talk about argument, and specifically about what the rhetoricians call the argument from authority, the argumentum ad vericundiam. Professor Pizer's remarks are all about authority, and specifically about which authority takes precedence when it comes to weighing public policy choices. Indeed, the Global Warming Policy Foundation's website is itself a kind of shrine to authority, or at least an imitation of it. The foundation, the site tells us, is all about, quote, restoring, and balance, restoring balance and trust to the climate debate, which again sounds suitably measured and grown up, who, after all, can be against either balance or trust. To a former public service broadcaster like me, the word balance suggests an even-handed approach to a topic, but that certainly isn't what the founders of the GWPF have in mind. Their site is an anthology of straightforward and thoroughgoing climate skepticism, much of it from familiar voices. Let's let one author and one title stand for many. Christopher Booker, the BBC and climate change, a triple betrayal. Only triple, I want to say, we must be slipping. Um, but in one sense, I think that the GWPF really is an attempt to restore balance in the debate. Faced with the formidable scientific institutions backing the case that dangerous climate change is almost certainly taking place, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, the Royal Society, and so on. The foundation is an attempt to put a heavy paw into the other scale by gathering together a group of committed climate skeptics, many with distinguished careers in government, business, and academia. Professor Pizer's remarks are best seen as a demand that these authorities, generally from other disciplines, should be taken as seriously, and when it comes to policy formulation, perhaps more seriously, than the scientists. This evening, I'm going to explore the, the present state of the argument from authority through a single prism, namely the way in which science is handled in argumentation about public policy. And I'm going to try and tease apart a paradox which genuinely perplexes most of the sciences I know, which is this. Almost everyone accepts that science gives us our most secure understanding of the physical world. So why doesn't it always carry the day? Surely, if anything can, science can pierce what I've called the cloud of unknowing and replace public bewilderment with public enlightenment. So why is it so often questioned and challenged by non-scientists without anyone accusing them of stupidity or absurdity? Why, when it comes to public policy formation or media discussions, is science so often regarded as one of the considerations rather than the card that trumps every other card. The distinction between speculation and opinion on the one hand and true understanding on the other is an ancient one. In Greek, the first is doxa, the second episteme. Throughout the history of Western thought, but especially from the Enlightenment onwards, philosophers have claimed a special role for science in the search for that true understanding. Here, in a splendid and well-known passage from an inquiry concerning human understanding, David Hume contrasts the knowledge which can be derived from mathematics and science from what he takes to be the idle and groundless speculation of scholastic theology. If we take into our hand any volume of divinity or school metaphysics, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number? No. Does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? No. Consign it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion. Hume's sense that science represents an epistemological gold standard is almost universal today. Like most non-scientists of my age and background, I accept that fundamental authority completely. And whenever it comes to an argument, I usually find myself instinctively on the side of mainstream science. Now, I don't do that because I've personally checked the evidence which underpins the origin of species or have examined Bohr's and Schrodinger's equations. I haven't the ex expertise to do either. No, I back science because I find Popper's account of the scientific method and its falsifiability intellectually compelling – 
And because at the level of common sense, the explanatory and predictive success of science is so overwhelming. Moreover, I've spent enough time with scientists to be convinced that the culture and practice of science genuinely aim at truth. As non-scientists then, our acceptance of the primacy of science is based less on our own scientific training than on a mixture of cultural, social, and philosophical factors. And this is exactly what's implied by the argumentum ad vericundiam. After all, if you can work out the equation for yourself, you don't have to take it on trust. But at the same time, many of us know that it's too simplistic to say that science is always and immediately correct. Sometimes there's not enough data, or the puzzle of what the data means has yet to be cracked, or the whole thing is still a work in progress. Sometimes, in other words, the science is, or at least appears, unfinished. On other occasions, scientists disagree. There are rival explanations, or there's one candidate explanation which some scientists back, but others oppose. In this, in this case, the science is disputed. On still other occasions, someone may call into question the good faith of the scientists. They're in the pay of the government, or big pharma, or they're committed to some cause, and therefore their work may lack impartiality, and thus reliability. We might call this corrupted, or even perverted science. And we also know, finally, that on a very few occasions, there have been dramatic revolutions in the history of science, when a consensus view has been overturned in favor of a radical new model or theory. Copernicus, Einstein, and that before such revolutions, scientific groupthink is possible. This is what Lee Smolin alleged about contemporary American physics and M-theory and string theory in his 2006 book, The Trouble with Physics. Though, of course, one would need to know a lot more than I do about the science to be judged whether he was right or not. So, as we listen to a given scientific debate, in theory, any number of doubts can appear. Yes, of course we still believe in the authority of good, finished, honest science. But maybe in this case, it's not quite ready. Or maybe we're in the middle of a he says, she says, she says wrangle, and God only knows who's right. Or maybe there is something fishy about the way that report was paid for. Or maybe that lone scientist I heard on the radio is right, and it's the other 99% of physicists who will be proven wrong in the end. In an age of pervasive suspicion and uncertainty, it doesn't take much for the weevils to get to work. And there's something else. Let's imagine a conversation between two characters. You can call them stereotypes, though I've met plenty of living examples of both of them. The first is a business person. They don't dismiss the green agenda out of hand, but they think there's a lot of nonsense and political correctness involved in it, and they're genuinely terrified about the cost and bureaucracy involved in some of the proposed solutions. To them, what the Global Warming Policy Foundation says probably makes a lot of sense. The second person I'll call the environmentalist. They're someone who worries at every level, from the practical to the moral, about the damage they believe humanity is doing to our, our ecosystem. They fear that policymakers are doing not too much, but too little and too late. The conversation begins with climate change, and unsurprisingly, the business person says they've got grave doubts about the so-called science behind global warming. Didn't those scientists in East Anglia do something wrong? Didn't even the IPCC drop a clangor about Himalayan glaciers? Are you a scientist, asked the environmentalist. And if not, who are you to doubt the conclusions reached by the overwhelming majority of the world's climatologists? Then the conversation switches to GM, genetically modified food. Now it's the environmentalist who voices doubts about the science. Perhaps it's not ready. Perhaps we don't understand the potential risks. Or perhaps because of the commercial interests involved, the science isn't truly independent. And now it's the business person who makes the case for simply backing the experts. In other words, our preconceptions, our worldview, can be, deter can be key in determining how far we're prepared to accept the authority of science or to turn up the dial on one of the available doubts. How can we predict whether someone is convinced or not convinced by the scientific case for anthropogenic global war warming. Well, it turns out that one good indication is how they vote. Numerous polls, both here and in America, have suggested that people to the left of the political spectrum are much more likely, or significantly more likely, to believe the case than those on the right. One's response to a piece of hard technical science can, to a significant degree, be a matter of political taste. <laughs> 
We can, therefore, tend to see science, like everything else, through the lens of our own beliefs and prejudices. And although scientific uncertainty is itself a technical field which requires scientific expertise fully to navigate, we can easily find ourselves treating the reliability of a given scientific claim as if it was like any other debate in which our own and other people's lay opinions are as good as anyone else's. And we can pick and choose. We probably won't argue the toss when a hospital consultant offers a diagnosis. We may very well believe we have something useful to add, something we've read in the paper or on the web, let's say, or just the benefit of our common sense, as a scientist explains the case for or against culling badgers. When we consider this background of preconception and expectation, of doubt and suspicion, against which science enters the arena of public debate, our paradox becomes easier to explain. But we need to add to all of this another issue which relates to the structure and character of argument itself. Public debates about science represent a messy clash between two not just different but diametrically opposed approaches to argument, scientific argument and advocacy. Scientific argument, if we imagine it idealized in a perfect scientific paper, seeks to state its case not just as clearly as possible, but in a sense as weakly as possible. Every objection, every area of doubt should be flagged up. Supposing there is a rival theory which our paper intends to argue against, it should be presented as strongly as possible. All of its good points should be set out before counterpoints are brought to bear. Advocacy does the opposite. Advocacy prefers to ignore or skate over the weak points in its own case and focus on those of its opponents. It feels less of an obligation to clar clarity and comprehensiveness and is quite happily to rely on rhetorical FX to win the day. Now, advocacy can itself be part of a systematic search for the truth in the context of a law court, for example, where each side can make their own case and challenge the others. But it is, it is a quite different way of seeking the truth. So what happens when you mix science and scientific argument and advocacy? Let's take the example of the UK's most distinguished scientific body, the Royal Society. In 2007, Channel 4 broadcast a documentary called The Great Global Warming Swindle, which, as its title suggests, aired very strongly skeptical views about global warming. It was the most high-profile part of a wave of skepticism, which many scientists feared might be turning public opinion against the case for anthropogenic climate change. In June that year, the Royal Society itself weighed in with a paper called Climate Change Controversies, A Simple Guide. It began with these words. The Royal Society has produced this overview of the current state of scientific understanding of climate change to help non-experts better understand some of the debates in this complex area of science. Then it lays its cards on the table. The paper, it says, is not intended to provide exhaustive answers to every contentious argument that has been put forward by those who seek to distort and undermine the science of climate change and deny the seriousness of the potential consequences of global warming. Indeed, the society, as the UK's National Academy of Science, responds here to eight key arguments that are currently in circulation by setting out where the weight of scientific evidence lies. There then follows punchy reposts to each of eight arguments put forward by climate skeptics on pages headed misleading argument one, misleading argument two, and so on. Now, this passage is almost a rhetorical mirror image of the remarks by Benny Pizer with which I opened. Now, the, quote, weight of scientific evidence and, quote, the UK's National Academy of Science in all their sober might are ranged against, quote, those who seek to distort and undermine the science of climate change. The only real caveat offered is that the consequences of global warming are only, quote, potential. Note also the withdrawal of the assumption of good faith. Those on the other side of the argument are seeking to distort and undermine the science. This is not an honest argument between honest people, but a battle between enlightened science and people who actually want to distort and undermine. The same claim can be found in a letter to the journal Science in 2010 from hundreds of members of the American National Academy of Sciences, 
but many recent assaults on climate science and more disturbingly on climate scientists by climate change deniers are typically driven by special interests or dogma, not by an honest effort to provide an alternative theory that credibly satisfies the evidence. Now, we're never told in either case what the precise evidence is of this malign intentionality, but I think we can be pretty sure that, to quote Hume, it doesn't directly arise from either quantity or number or experimental reasoning. This is advocacy, clear and strongly expressed. This is how the Royal Society guide ends. We must also prepare for the impacts of climate change, some of which are already inevitable. It says not probably inevitable, but inevitable. Now, as a piece of advocacy, this is pretty formidable. It uses the extraordinary authority of the Royal Society to full effect, and it sets out its case in plain language and with far fewer conditions and qualifications than one would normally expect to see in a, in a communication from scientists. And you can guess what happened. 43 members of the Royal Society complained about the tone of climate change controversies, and in particular about its alleged stridency and failure to acknowledge fully areas of uncertainty in the science. Accordingly, the Royal Society commissioned a new guide which was eventually published in the autumn of 2010. Now, the rhetorical flavor of this second guide is markedly different from the first. It is called Climate Change, a Summary of the Science, and at least to my layman's eye and ear, it is exactly that. Now the question of scientific uncertainty is dealt with at length. Indeed, the guide is partly structured along a spectrum of certainty. Um, it has sections with titles like Aspects of Climate Change, where there is a wide consensus but continuing debate and discussion, as opposed to, quote, aspects that are not yet well understood. Now, as far as I can tell, the underlying scientific evidence on which the two guides rely is identical. I've no doubt that the majority of the scientists who signed off on the second guide were just as convinced that the weight of evidence pointed to a high probability of anthropogenic warming as the authors of the first. The difference between the two guides is in the character of the argumentation. The second draws back from the techniques and language of advocacy towards so something which is much closer to straightforward exposition. Reaction to the second guide was predictable. BBC News reported Professor Anthony Kelly, one of the Royal Society Fellows who criticised the first paper and who happens to be a member of the Academic Advisory Board of the Global Warming Policy Foundation, as saying that this new guide had, quotes, gone a long way to meeting our concerns. Some on the other side of the argument were much less happy. Bob Ward of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment said he doubted whether membership of both the Royal Society and the Global Warming Policy Foundation was even reconcilable. Now, depending on your own position, you may well feel considerable sympathy with scientists who believe that the climate is almost certainly changing in a dangerous way, who further believe that disinformation is causing public skepticism and confusion to grow, and who therefore decide to put their case with the forcefulness which advocacy offers. As I suggested earlier, that growth in scepticism is demonstrable. A populist poll suggested that even between the autumn of 29 and the spring of 2010, the numbers of those in this country who said they did not believe that global warming was taking place had jumped from 15% to 25%. And those who agreed with the statement that, quote, man-made climate change is environmental propaganda for which there is little or no evidence rose from 9% to 14%. By contrast, one survey suggested that no fewer than 97%, 97% of atmospheric scientists believe that man-made climate change is happening. So, a perceived threat to the planet, a widening gap between experts and public, a live policy debate. In circumstances like these, one can easily see how advocacy can seem like a duty. Nor am I suggesting that a scientist who goes down that path is doing anything wrong. What I am suggesting is that the admixture of advocacy and dispassionate scientific exposition makes the question of authority a good deal more complex. The governing body of the BBC, the BBC Trust, recently commissioned the eminent British scientist Professor Steve Jones to report on the impartiality and accuracy of the way in which the BBC covers science. They published his review in August last year. Steve Jones' report is a serious piece of work which was welcomed and accepted almost in its entirety by the BBC 
and by me as the BBC's editor-in-chief. But if you read the report, which I'd, I'd recommend you do, you'll come across an argument, a rather civilised argument, it must be said, but an argument nonetheless, between Steve Jones and some of my former colleagues in the BBC, which goes to the heart of this question of authority. When it comes to impartiality, to what extent should the BBC treat science like everything else, politics, religion, the arts, and to what extent should it treat it differently because of science's unique epistemological claims? To caricature the two extremes, the first would suggest that science should climb into the boxing ring like everything else and submit to all the usual rules of adversarial debate. The second, that the role of the broadcaster when a scientist wants to speak is to turn on the microphone at the start and to say thank you at the end. Now, the actual debate was a good deal subtler than that. But Professor Jones was definitely on the side of a privileged position for science. And he was consequently very nervous of the idea of impartiality, if impartiality meant balance, and balance meant a 50-50 balance between mainstream science on the one hand and marginal or downright unscientific or anti-scientific opinion on the other. Against that, some BBC senior editors argue that given how integral science is to so many policy debates, given that there are sometimes genuine disagreements between scientists, that there are real editorial dangers in putting science into a wholly protected category. Not least that if the public do not hear science being scrutinized and challenged in the way that everything else is, they may actually believe science is less rather than more. So what's the way through this particular conundrum? For me, the key is in the phrase the BBC uses to describe its obligation to treat controversies fairly. Um, uh, and it's, it's not a matter beyond party politics of simply testing everything with a stopwatch, but of giving due impartiality, due impartiality. The danger to health from smoking has been so clearly established that it would not be impartial but irresponsible to give a smoking enthusiast equal time with the chief medical officer. In the BBC's coverage of climate change, that triple betrayal according to Christopher Booker, we've tried progressively to adjust the balance of the debate to reflect shifts in the underlying science and the developing findings of the IPCC and other scientific bodies over time. Professor Jones says that some of his BBC interlocutors suggested that impartiality implies, quote, equality of voice. That's not my view. For me, it's important that editors ask themselves how much scientific support a given position has and adjust the prominence they give to that position accordingly. There remain a few serious skeptics within science about climate change, and I believe it will be wrong to do what some scientists call for, which is effectively to ban them from the airwaves. Censorship is a way, in my view, of undermining rather than building public trust. I do, however, believe that their arguments and the amount of time they have to expound upon them should broadly reflect the support they enjoy within science, which is very low. Unfortunately, the media, both here and abroad, have often failed to apply this weighting to the way they cover science and medical stories. There's a danger of what one could call good horse race bias, a tendency to ignore a disproportion of underlying scientific support in order to run a more evenly matched and therefore more satisfying debate. Andrew Wakefield's claims, initially aired in a 1998 Lancet paper, that there was a link between the MMR vaccine and autism, would ultimately be described in another learned medical uh, journal as, quotes, perhaps the most damaging medical hoax of the last hundred years. Mr. Wakefield was struck off the medical register for serious professional misconduct in 2010. The evidence that there was no demonstrable link between the vaccine and autism would mount over the years, but authoritative studies cast grave doubt on the Wakefield claims very early on, and official medical advice about the net benefits of the vaccine never wavered. But when the story played out around a decade ago, it was covered in the UK media and sometimes on the BBC as if the argument was in fact evenly balanced. The Today programme, for instance, which covered the story assiduously, often mounted on-air debates in which, for instance, the medically untrained representative of a parent's pressure group on vaccines would be given equal time with a government medical expert. Britain's newspapers also often treated the story as if it was a good, even-handed talking point, though they soon became distracted by the fascinating ad hominem question of whether the then Prime Minister Tony Blair's son, Leo, 
had been given the vaccine. All this credence given to the Wakefield theory had its effect. A Today programme poll in 2001 discovered that no fewer than 79% of respondents thought there should be a public inquiry into the topic. And of course, many parents simply decided not to allow their children to be given the vaccine. Irresponsible repetition of unwarranted doubts about the MMR vaccine had caused, caused actual damage to public health. To me, this is not impartial journalism, but ignorant and shallow, and in the end, dangerous journalism. Caution of the MMR controversy is, is a tale, coverage of the MMR controversy is a cautionary tale about just how unwise it can be to apply the same approach to balance in science that one might to political debate. As Professor Jones says in his report, checks and balances and impartiality are already built into the scientific method, and it's not difficult for responsible specialist journalists to establish the view of the science community on a given claim or controversy. This is what the BBC strives to do at its best, and I have to say I believe it's got much better in its coverage of science in both journalism and in documentary in recent years. But what happens if supporters of the majority scientific view cross the line into advocacy and, for instance, overstate the actual level of scientific certainty or accuse their opponents of bad faith? In covering that specific argument about the first Royal Society guide, say, does the core authority of science stretch so far that there should still be nine people saying the guide is, comp guide is completely fine for everyone who says it is flawed? And supposing the discussion turns to possible policy responses to climate change, responses that raise a host of political and economic questions which are, perhaps unlike the underlying science, underdetermined and fully open to political debate. We might not agree with Dr. Pizer's implied ordering of the relative importance of science, economics, and social commentary, but we probably do have to accept that in this discussion, our approach to impartiality will have to be somewhat different. Now, you might say, why not keep the two separate? Why not deal with the pure science, let's call it sphere A, over here, and deal with the debate about the policy implications, sphere B, over here? And it is useful indeed, wherever possible, to distinguish in the presentation of such stories to the public between what the science is and the discussion of what it means and what we should do about it. But in the real world, the two spheres are often jumbled together. The whole point of Dr. Pizer's remarks are to claim that the costs of the proposed mitigations to climate change, sphere B, are not justified by the probability of it actually happening, sphere A. And as we've seen, there are many science, scientists and scientific bodies which are not content to restrict their public utterances to sphere A and who also seek to combine, sometimes even to blur the two. In practice, the ubiquitous admixture of opinion, doxa, to establish scientific fact or at least widespread consensus, episteme, means that the type and strength of authority that is being brought to bear in the argument and therefore how it should be treated is often far from straightforward. For David Hume, the decision to keep the works of Sir Isaac Newton and to throw the works of Sir St. Thomas Aquinas into the fire is an easy one. But let's imagine him going through a pile of contemporary materials about climate change, that first Royal Society guide, Sir Nick Stern's report, even the promulgations of the IPCC. When it comes to public policy form formulation, it's probably not just impossible, but undesirable to attempt to keep the science qua science entirely separate from the discussion of political and economic responses. But how far then does the special writ of science authority run? And that's really only the start of our problems. Because in the hurly-burly of public discourse, all sorts of other authorities are also at work. Anita Howarth, in her paper, Contested Processes, Contested Influence, looks at how the GM debate played out in the UK mass media from the mid-90s to the early 2000s. She identifies a key moment in 1998 when a new voice of authority entered the debate. The catalyst for the Daily Mail's uh, arrival on the scene was an article in the Daily Telegraph by Prince Charles, which enabled them to frame the debate in terms of ethics, religion, uncertain science, and unknown effects. They also highlighted the associations made by Prince Charles between GMO and BSE in terms of unpredictable consequences, unknown effects, and uncertain science. By the autumn of that year, she claims, 
the debate had swung decisively towards uncertainty and the unacceptability of that uncertainty to the public. And one of the things that may have tipped the balance was an intervention by the heir to the throne. Prince Charles used a quite different sort of authority to shift the center of gravity of that debate away from the science, where he had no expertise to offer, towards ethics and religion, where his own authority, both by dint of his status and the reputation he'd built up with the public over many years, could really count. Ethical considerations, atavistic fears, including the fear of science, stray images and preconceptions can all play a part in the battle for authority. In their study of biotechnology in the popular press in Flanders, Knowledge, Culture and Power, Peter Maseli and Dimitri Sherman include an intriguing table of the metaphors used in the Flemish popular press between 2000 and 2004 to describe the debate about different kinds of biotech. And there were a lot of them. Of the 506 articles they examined, more than 200 contained metaphors, often multiple metaphors, so there was a total of 400 metaphors altogether. Here are a few of them. GM, GMO, use of the Frankenstein metaphor, very familiar one, 22 times. GMOs pollutants, four times. The battle of GMOs is a crusade, twice. Cloning is Jurassic Park, six times. Cloning means eternal life, 26 times. Genetic manipulation is a Nazi practice, 10 times. Genetic manipulation is Brave New World, six times. Genetic manipulation is an activity pursued by Saddam Hussein, once. <laughs> and so on. And although a few are positive, the overwhelming majority of the metaphors are negative, many of them nightmarish. The powerful and crucially readily comprehensible narratives evoked by the use of words like Frankenstein, Jurassic Park, or Nazi, all of them redolent of science gone wrong or perverted to evil ends have the effect of setting up an incoherent but nonetheless potent anti-authority which some members of the public may find more persuasive than scientific authority itself. Massili and Sherman conclude that in Flanders at least, what they call the scientific industrial complex has either lost or is losing the interpretive struggle. Beneath the surface, all sorts of beliefs and influences are at work in that interpretive struggle. Rachel Carson's 1962 book about the use of pesticides, Silent Spring, set up a substantial body of empirical evidence. But what made the book resonant was its elegiac tone and the way it cast the issue of our stewardship of nature into a language of moral responsibility, which has remained an important element in the debate about the environment ever since. Bjorn Lomborg has written, convincingly in my view, about how the Club of Rome's famous 1972 report, The Limits to Growth, created a paradigm about economic growth and the exhaustion of the world's natural resources, which remains extraordinarily influential 40 years on, even though virtually every one of the specific predictions it made has turned out to be wrong. With these themes of stewardship, moral responsibility, and the fragile and threatened integrity of nature, it's hardly surprising that in the middle of arguments about science and the environment, one often stumbles on language which has a quasi-religious quality. Nor indeed is this restricted to those who are arguing against science. When it comes to topics like climate change, one sometimes hears it from scientists themselves. Now, I'm not suggesting that the Green Movement is religious as such, simply that multiple paradigms and cultural themes are at work in the language we can find ourselves using about nature and science and the feelings we have about them. Scientific authority, then, finds itself having to make its case not in a, in a vacuum, not in a rhetorical vacuum, but in a jostling crowd of rival influences and illusions. Inevitably, there are some who wish it were not so. Writing recently in Nature, Dan Cahan, a professor at Yale Law School who comments on the climate change debate, suggested that the problem with successfully communicating information to the public about the science lies not with the public's reasoning capacity, but with what he calls quotes, the polluted science communication environment that drives people apart. He goes on to say, overcoming this dilemma requires collective strategies to protect the quality of the science communication environment from the pollution of divisive cultural meanings. Divisive cultural meanings. So now, rather brilliantly, we have an ecology of language itself. And instead of pesticides, we have a pollution of divisive cultural meanings. But although we might sympathize with Professor Kahan's frustration 
Surely those divisive cultural meanings are an inevitable part of post-enlightenment pluralism and open democratic debate. And even if we could imagine some collective strategies which could protect us from them, would we really want to employ them? And who would decide which of the cultural meanings was divisive? That too would be a question of authority. Once again, like last night, we can hear the ghost of Plato stirring. Meanwhile, I think we should expect the role of authority in public discourse to continue to evolve and be contested. We live in an age of heroic brand extension, and we can see something similar when it comes to authority. So it's no surprise to us when many papers and the BBC website reported the following urgent headline in 2010, Stephen Hawking, God did not create universe. It's a headline because Professor Hawking is an eminent scientist, perhaps the most famous scientist in the world. But how much scientific authority should be assigned to this statement? Does it contain reasoning about number or experiment? Well, not exactly. Indeed, it seems to have been largely prompted by the discovery that Professor Hawking had a new book coming out. <laughs> a scientist explaining that the evidence for Darwinian evolution means that a fundamentalist interpretation of Genesis must be wrong does, in my view, pass the Hume test. Someone who told us that we should rely on their authorities as scientists when they offer us personal financial advice does not. Professor Hawking's remarks about God seem to lie somewhere in the middle. The extension of authority is not always a risky business. Years ago, uh, I commissioned a leading zoologist, Aubrey Manning, to make a series about geology for BBC Two. Aubrey only had a general knowledge of geology, but he'd always been intrigued by the geological context for his own biological studies, and the resulting programs were an effective combination of the presenter as authority figure, fully conversant with the scientific method, and the presenter as vicarious viewer, finding things out alongside us during the course of the series. But it's not hard to think of examples in television or elsewhere in the media of authority being stretched so far that the elastic eventually snaps. In our newspapers, you'll find examples of every kind of translated authority, from the film star who has suddenly become an expert in nutrition or Eastern mysticism, to the, no the notable retired politician who feels fully equipped to sound off on pretty much everything. Sometimes one comes across a letter about some matter of public concern signed by a long list of notables from many different and unconnected backgrounds. This is authority sliced and diced and repackaged like the collateralized debt obligations which precipitated the financial crisis. Authority, each piece of which may be very far from its point of origin and justification, but where it's still hoped that the whole can somehow be greater than the parts. We might have hoped that authority might be one sure way of piercing the cloud of unknowing. Instead, we find that even the most clear-cut authority, that derived from science, can find itself in the most opaque, impenetrable corners of the cloud. And if what I've said this evening is true of science, it's probably even more true of economics and the other social sciences, indeed any area of professional expertise which intersects with the world of public debate and policy. Misrepresentation is undoubtedly often part of the problem. But I've, as I've tried to demonstrate this evening, it's too easy to blame the public's lack of knowledge or unwillingness to trust science entirely on the dark forces of misrepresentation. When science enters the public arena, it almost always ends up having to play by at least some of the rules of that arena, rules which often confuse the question of authority. It also finds itself in competition with radically asymmetrical rhetorical forces which derive their power from the spheres of morality, culture, superstition, even the mystic. But to wish that we could eliminate those divisive cultural meanings is to wish away the freedom and openness on which modern democracies are built. And short of dictatorship, it's impossible to achieve anyway. In my view, our task rather is to find practical ways of helping the public pick their own way through this difficult, cluttered landscape. I've tried this evening to give some examples of how it is possible to parse public statements about science and to disentangle them so that one can analyze and understand the different elements, exposition, assertion, opinion, and advocacy. It takes time and on its own way, a little training. Our challenge is how to encourage more people to take the time and acquire the skills to do this for themselves. I'll, I'll return to that theme tomorrow, but I want to leave you 
with a parting thought which is particularly relevant to this professorship. I spent the whole of this afternoon talking about science, but in doing that, I've relied on a sensibility and a set of techniques that absolutely derive from the humanities. People sometimes talk about the humanities as if they are an ind indulgence we can no longer either need or, or afford. But without them, who is going to be able to address problems like the ones I've explored this evening? Science is the most formidable intellectual force of our age, perhaps of any age. But the irony is that without the insights of the humanities, it may still find itself without words. Thank you very much.